Hi, thanks for joining me today as we discuss problems that heavy fuel oil use poses for its users, along with some of the best practice solutions that are available to solve these problems. My name is Eric Bjornstad. I'm the Technical Information Director here at Bell Performance. And uh, by the conclusion of our discussion today, uh, <clears throat> we're going to aim that you be more familiar with the hows and the whys and the when uh, that these common problems inherent with the use of heavy fuel oil occur. So we're going to cover in uh, and deposit phenomenon, uh, both of which uh, the kind that result from the from heavy fuel oil use. Uh, we're going to look at corrosion, both high and low temperature. We're going to consider the factors and the consequences that are related to having of carbon particulates in the HFO combustion process. And in addition to these, we also want to touch on emissions. We want to touch on opacity problems that HFO users might encounter. You know what contributes to emissions and and of course, what can be done about them? And finally, we'll look at uh, petroleum fuel sludging tendencies, why those happen, and uh, why those actually cost HFO users money. And then we'll aim to wrap all this together with a consideration of the best practice solutions for these problems. And of course, we will consider and the whys that these solutions have benefits for HFO users. So. Um, first thing we have to consider is that HFO, heavy fuel oil, brings inherent problems that, with it that stem from its composition and from how it burns. Uh, we will touch on each of these in a little detail later, but these problems can be summarized as boiler tube depositing, as you can see on your screen. Uh, you can get flame impingement. You can get, of course, high temperature corrosion and low temperature corrosion, uh, and you can get loss of operational efficiency. Uh, excessive emissions like SOX and NOx uh, in the flue gases uh, with uh, loss of production availability. Shut down, shutting everything that a plant can do from a production standpoint. Uh, and of course, as we just mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, there can be sludge dropout with corresponding loss of heating value from that fuel. So all of these problems have a certain effects on the facility's operational efficiency and on their operating conditions. So it's worth our effort and it's worth it's worth our effort to learn a little bit more about them and it's worth the operator's effort to address these problems because they all cost them money. So to understand these problems better, we need to start by looking at what happens in a typical fuel oil combustion system. See, within the boiler unit itself, we have a couple of things going on that direct uh, that directly relate to problems seen by fuel oil users. So uh, the fuel is transported and mixed with air, and it's burned in the furnace, uh, and ash forms from the inorganic com components of that fuel that do not, of course, burn during combustion. And while this is going on, you will have different kinds of deposits being formed. And some of these deposits are strong with corrosion problems. So when we consider what we need to do to create or move towards the most free HFO use experience possible. These are all areas that we need to look a little bit more closely at. So we start by looking at the hows and the whys of slagging and deposit problems stemming from HFO use. The term slagging refers to, it's a descriptive term describing deposit buildup on tube surfaces. Now these slag deposits are typically formed from the accumulation of fly ash particles. And so the fly ash particles that hit the tube, they contain a mixture. They contain a mixture of unburned carbon and they contain inorganic components uh, like salts and oxides of the metals that came from the heavy fuel oil, nickel and vanadium and sodium aluminum, silicon, sulfur, those kinds of things. Now, slagging can be influenced by things like um, combustion conditions in the boiler. It can be influenced by fuel composition. It can even be influenced by the composition of the alloys in themselves. All of these together will affect or influence slag formation. They'll influence the rate of buildup of slag, and they will also very influence the corrosive nature of such deposits. So when you talk about fuel composition, 
the vanadium content of the fuel directly impacts flagging problems. Um, there are, in, when, when burns, the vanadium oxidizes and creates a number of different vanadium oxides or vanadates. And V2O5 is the vanadate or the vanadium oxide that causes the most problems. Now, the formation, the amount of V2O5 that's formed is dependent on the amount of oxygen available in the boiler. As you can see from this data, you have uh, the percentage of the different vanadates uh, that are in a, a given deposit formed from HFO use. Uh, and then that percentage graphed relative to the percentage of excess air. And what you can see clearly is that when excess air is low, like 3% or below, then the blue, the amount of V2O5, the problematic one that's formed, stays relatively low. The red, which are the V2O3 and V2O4, are predominantly the majority of that, that compound. But when you find, when the operator finds themselves having to increase the excess to 4% or 5%, it doesn't get up to 15, this is just for reference, but when they increase the excess air up, the more that they increase it, the more V2O5 is formed. And that is the one that causes the most problems. And of course, um, you know, if they're trying to keep the V2O5 uh, formation low, uh, they can't just decrease the amount of oxygen indefinitely because lowering the oxygen content can lead to other problems in itself. Namely, it will directly impact the, com the completeness of combustion of the fuel. So the operator here is already having to strike a balance between providing, on the one hand, providing enough oxygen for combustion, and also, on the other hand, minimizing the formation of problematic deposits that have low melting points. And low melting point deposits are a problem because they are a key contributor to many of the problems that fuel oil users are trying to face. So let's look at them. Some problems for HFO users arise in part when they get these low melting point deposits formed. Um, when the fuel has the wrong mix uh, of vanadium and sodium, then it can form deposits that have a metallic composition such that the, uh, the, the melting points of those deposits are pretty low. Here you can see some things. Uh, a deposit that is just V2O5 has a melting point of around 675 degrees centigrade. When you start adding sodium into it, uh, such as when you have a seven to one ratio here, um, uh, you get an even lower melting point, 535. When you, when you have this kind of deposit, the melting point's even lower, 480 degrees. Now, uh, note this last one. When you take out the sodium, when you start adding magnesium, into it, suddenly you get a magnesium vanadium oxide uh, com compound or, you know, well, the important thing to note is that the melting point when you add magnesium to it actually skyrockets up to close to 1200 degrees. It's a very important consideration uh, for fixing these problems as we'll see later. So when you have, when, when uh, an HFO user has deposits that are like these and have low melting points, well, these low melting point deposits or compounds, uh, they, they have problematic physical properties. They're sticky. They build up on furnace walls and they provide a sticky substrate for other, for additional ash and additional deposit forming components to stick and build up on furnace walls and superheaters and reheater tubes, all of those kinds of things. So uh, the typically the danger zone for this happening is when you have a vanadium and sodium ratio that is between one to one and four to one by weight. Uh, that happens, you can get something that looks like this. This is ash deposit has a melting point of only 600 degrees centigrade. And typically, the, uh, the hotter areas of the system is the temperatures are higher than 600 degrees, significantly higher. And so it will tend to exist in this kind of shiny semi-liquid state that you can see here. Because it's sticky, 
it sticks to surfaces really well. It sticks more tenaciously to those surfaces, which makes it harder to clean off during service intervals. In other words, it increases the maintenance costs that are associated with cleaning these off during service intervals. Now, what are the problems that these kind of slagging deposits called? Well, they're associated with a number of major issues that together are serious enough for fuel oil users to have to seek out solutions to them. So what do we have? Well, first of all, uh, when you have slagging on tubes, it insulates those tubes and lowers transferability, which means the heat isn't properly going in and out of the tube, it might even cause problematic temperature shifts. They can cause, as we have alluded to, they can cause high temperature corrosion if they have the right ratio of vanadium to sodium oxides. Uh, they help to catalyze the formation of the SO2 gas to SO3 gas, which causes a problem for cold and corrosion later on. Uh, of course, we just mentioned they are associated with higher maintenance costs, including even replacement of tubes that have become damaged or corroded over time. Uh, and then all of these play into loss of production because they have to shut down more often for cleaning and they have a lower boiler efficiency. And here you have examples of what some of these might look like. Uh, this U HFO user, this is, they have a significant deposit accumulation on their water wall tubes. Uh, same customer, uh, significant superheater deposits. That's what some of those might look like if you happen to look inside of their furnace while it was operating. So a big reason why we have to consider these things like deposit formation is because they, among other things, are crucially related to an even bigger headache for fuel oil users, which is high temperature corrosion and low temperature corrosion phenomenon. And no discussion about solving heavy fuel oil problems would even be close to being complete without a consideration of the causes and solutions of these corrosion issues. So first, thing, first one, cold and corrosion. Now, cold and corrosion is also called low temperature corrosion. And it's the phenomenon where you get sulfur trioxide, SO3, and it condenses with, uh, it, it converts to sulfuric acid because it condenses with water vapor. And then this acid condenses later on in the system in the areas of the boiler unit. And uh, when you have acid condensing onto metal surfaces, you can probably guess what happens. Not a good thing. <clears throat> now, to understand this phenomenon, to understand this process, we first have to consider the fact that Sulfur comes from the fuel oil. All fuel oil, uh, because it is a residual fuel, it's the leftover stuff uh, from the, the crude oil. Um, so sulfur content, and this sulfur has to go somewhere. Whatever's in the, the HFO is gonna go somewhere. So the HFO has sulfur content. When it's burned, the sulfur content combines with oxygen and forms SO2 gas. And so far, we don't have a problem. However, a certain percentage uh, of this SO2 gas will, given enough time and the right conditions, will actually oxidize further. It'll have an additional oxygen added to it, which converts it from sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide. And this is a problem. Um, how much converts, how much of this conversion happens? Well, it depends on certain things, but one of the things it can depend on is if there's a physical presence of certain catalysts like iron oxide or, very importantly, vanadium oxides. So this SO3 is a problem because at some point later, it's going to find itself in proximity with water vapor. Remember, combustion, proper combustion yields uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor. So there's going to be water vapor that this SO3 is going to be in proximity to. And at some point, it will combine, it will condense with it as it cools down and it forms sulfuric acid. And then that sulfuric acid, if it reaches the right temperature, will condense out onto metal and iron surfaces, typically in colder areas like the air preheater or even the stack. And you get this really problematic 
cold and corrosion issues. And this, this is a very serious issue for plant operators. They want to avoid this at all costs. So the question is, what can they do about this? If they want to prevent it, what can they do about it? Well, there's four things that they can do. Well, uh, first one is they could try switching to a fuel that has a lower sulfur content to begin with. Lower sulfur going in, less SO2 and SO3 gas being formed at all. However, it may not always be financially feasible to do this because lower sulfur it's more processed and it's it can be significantly more expensive and financial constraints may not even allow this to be an option. Second thing they could they could try to influence the amount of SO2 and SO3 formed by the amount of oxygen that they supply. Because, see, because these sulfur gases are formed from uh, combining the sulfur in the fuel with the oxygen in the air, you can theoretically reduce, if you can reduce excess oxygen, the amount of oxygen that's available, you can reduce SOX formation. However, the downside is you cannot reduce it too much because you need a certain amount of oxygen in order to maintain your optimal combustion level and your optimal efficiency level. Um, another one that they can do is uh, they can use a magnesium additive. Add a magnesium additive to the fuel. And what it does is it actually coats the surface of the, uh, the, the vanadium deposits that are uh, normally accumulating on these walls. If you coat the surface, you then reduce the contact between gas and this, uh, this cat the presence of this catalytic substance. And so you will reduce the conversion of SO2 over to SO3. And then the last thing that fourth option is, uh, again, using a magnesium-based additive, they can add it with the intention of using it to react with the SO3 that's formed in order to form innocuous magnesium sulfate salts. Um, are four options, some more feasible than others, that plant operators have to try and keep these problems at bay. But cold and corrosion is not by any means the only kind of corrosion that fuel oil users have to worry about. We also have the corollary one, high temperature corrosion, and it is just as problematic as low temperature corrosion. Um, high temperature corrosion issues are tied or related to the presence of these vanadate deposits that we were talking about. These vanadate deposits on metal surfaces, they have low boiling points, or excuse me, low melting points. So uh, they exist in a liquid or a semi-liquid state when they're close to the metal of, of the tubes, and they're highly corrosive and damaging to those metal surfaces. And then not only that, but when the plant cools down, let's say when they're, 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 they're uh, running down the plant uh, in preparation for doing some kind of maintenance, when these uh, deposits cool, they become very hard, they become very glassy, and they become very difficult to remove, which means uh, boiler cleaning time and a lot more expense. So let's take a look a more closely at how these are formed, these deposits, deposits, how they're formed, and then what happens when they do get formed. Okay, as we said, hot, hot, hot corrosion is just as problematic all things considered, as uh, cold end corrosions. What are the possible solutions to this? Well, um, the solutions, first of all, you could try increasing their melting points. You can do something that will change their consistency and actually cause the melting points to go from, let's say, 600 degrees centigrade to 1200 degrees centigrade. You would have a lot greater chance of reducing these semi-liquid deposits that are corroding and damaging those tubes. And that's precisely what these folks did. But they used a magnesium treatment to do precisely that. Before, they had these characteristic uh, corrosive, almost pitting damage on their, their, their high temperature tubes. This is in the hot zone, the high temperature zone. When they used the magnesium treatment, it actually fixed this problem. And this is what those tubes looked like after a treatment, uh, after a certain amount of time with that treatment. 
So they added something to the fuel oil. It caused the deposits form to be of higher melting point, which made those deposits less corrosive and changed their physical consistency, making them easier to remove so that their two boiler tubes looked like this, not like this. Now, beyond corrosion, the operator must have they've got another thing they have to balance here. We've mentioned low temperature corrosion, we mentioned high temperature corrosion. We've established that both of those are serious enough issues that the operator is going to want to avoid them if at all possible. But not only do they have those problems to contend with, they also need to balance that with the overriding need to get the best combustion possible because after all, that's their primary thing. They're burning fuel oil, they're converting the carbon heat energy in the hopes of doing something like generate power or or help generate some kind of industrial output. That's the number one thing they're doing. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many times if they're trying to balance combustion efficiency with reducing corrosion, it becomes kind of a robbing Peter to pay Paul situation, so to speak. So let's talk about now Complete and proper combustion of petroleum should yield two things, right? Should yield carbon dioxide and should yield water vapor. It actually should yield three things because you also get the ash that's formed from the oxides of the inorganic components of that petroleum. So three things. Now, if you have the presence of soot or you have the presence of uh, some level of carbon particulate, well, what this means is that you are not getting optimal combustion. Um, it means that all of the carbon content in the HFO is not being fully burned and not being turned into the energy that you need to have it turned into. And this means you're not getting optimal fuel usage. You're not getting everything that you paid for. Uh, the, the culprit, the causes for this, there could be any number of causes within a given plant setting. So, of course, no matter what causes it, uh, you know, no matter what it is, you know, what, whatever you want to place the blame on, you still have to contend with the important question, uh, which is how can they solve such a problem? Well, um, in order to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to the 1950s. 1950s is when I want to say it was uh, sometimes I mistake them, uh, I mix them up with DuPont, but Dow Chemical, 1950s. They start research on organometallics. Specifically, what they're doing is they are taking different combinations of organo of metals in organometallic form, meaning they are petroleum soluble forms. And what effect they have on helping to improve combustion. And what they find is that there are certain organometallic uh, metals and also combinations of metals that actually dramatically improve the completeness of combustion. How, how do they do this? Well, there's a number of ways that they do it. I mean, one of the ways without getting too overly, you know, overly technical would be appropriate for our purposes. But one of the ways is that they, they help produce more radicals, more OH molecules, more uh, single oxygen molecules and these kinds of radicals are extremely reactive and they will want to do things like participate in more combustion reactions. So these organometallics, they, what, what research showed is that they were able to improve combustion essentially, essentially by acting on the fuel oil droplet and increasing the amount of vulnerable or volatile components that came out of the fuel oil at any given time. Um, another thing that they did, again, trying to keep this uh, as simple as possible, is they lower the uh, activation energies for the combustion reactions to occur. Simply put, combustion is a really, really fast chain reaction or series of lots of chemical reactions taking place. And those chemical reactions are all producing heat, lots and lots and lots of heat. So... If you add an organometallic combustion catalyst, what it actually does is it lowers the amount of energy that each of these reactions needs in order to get started. All, uh, all chemical reactions need a certain energy input at the beginning to help drive them. Uh, so if you lower the energies of activation, if you make 
more of these reactions happen faster, then you're going to get higher temperatures, you're going to get more complete combustion, you're going to get greater combustion happening faster and earlier in the process. That is what organometallic combustion caps do. So another riddle for HFO users and uh, plant operators, another riddle to end with is uh, this issue of opacity and the issue of emissions, both of which are big, big issues in today's uh, shall we say, political climate. They are trying to, they have to throw this into the balance. They're already having to balance getting the best combustion with preventing the few, having the fewest problems. Now they have to take those two and they have to balance. We also have to make sure we don't have an opacity problem and not an emissions problem. And so typically what they will have to try and find the answer to is how do they use their airflow, the amount of oxygen that's supplied. How can they use that and make adjustments to that in order to control opacity and control emissions in the best way possible? So an operator, the amount of air that's supplied in the furnace, depending on what they need to do. So whenever we talk about oxygen and lowering excess oxygen or increasing excess oxygen, what we are talking about is Increasing air volume or decreasing air volume, the vo pure volume of air that's allowed to go into the boiler. That operator does this. Now, they will adjust this volume up and down depending on what they need to do. If they provide more air, i.e. if they increase the excess oxygen levels, well, they're going to get more greater combustion. They're going to get fewer particles that look like this that look like this. They're going to get better combustion, more complete combustion, and they're going to have not as that's formed. Um, but uh, they can't just increase the airflow and not. Um, the first one, which is not illustrated on the slide, is recall that 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 red that, that we uh, looked at a few minutes ago where we talked about vanadate formation. What we saw was that if you increase ox the oxygen amount above 35 to 4%, you dramatically increased the amount of thick vanadate deposits that were formed in your border. So that's consequence number one. Consequence number two, side number two is, Adding more oxygen means you get more SO3 formed because you have more oxygen available for SO2 to further react with. Uh, downside number three, you get a higher incidence of cold and corrosion and acid plumes. And an unattended consequence is that you can actually decrease your fuel economy. You're having, you're heating a larger volume of excess air, and that excess air will eventually leave and you lose that heat when that hot air leaves. So again, it's a balancing act. They're getting better combustion, but you deal with these, these problems that come along with it. So what about the converse? What about decreasing airflow to prevent these problems? Well, as you may guess, has its own problems as well. Um, uh, as you can see, you know, if, you, if you decrease uh, the oxygen that's applied, you're going to get more soot formation. You're not going to get as complete combustion. So you're going to get more soot formation. You're going to increase unburned carbon particulates. You're, of course, you're, you may have a uh, reduced fuel economy because you're simply not applying enough oxygen to have the most complete combustion as possible. On the flip side, decreasing the air can do a couple of good things that contribute to actually improving Again, balancing act. One side goes up, the other side goes down. Uh, so a couple of good things that can happen when you uh, decrease the air intake. Well, if you decrease the air intake, remember that means you're supplying less volume of air, which means you're not heating as much excess air volume, which means you're not going to lose as much heat efficiency that way. And of course, the, these other two are the opposites of what we were just talking about. In increasing air intake increases SO3 formation. So therefore, decreasing 
her intake decreases tendency for SF3 formation, which means less cold and corrosion as well, and less acetone. So the operational challenge for these folks, and if you're in the industry, you 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 already know this. You know what I'm going to say. The operational challenge is that you have to find the right balance, getting the best efficiency while <clears throat> doing the best job at these kind of problems. So, um, you know, just for a lot of HFO burning plants, um, you know, we we talked, we mentioned and they're a serious problem for a lot of these kinds of plants. Um, you know, you can have, a, a, if you have an emissions plume and you have an opacity problem, well, that can be seen uh, by the public, and that is a big public relations nightmare. Um, typically, when you have an opacity, uh, the, the causal factor have SO3 presence along with unburned carbon presence. And so the two of those combining, uh, you know, the SO3 combines with water, forms acid. The acid actually condenses onto the little tiny particulates. And so you get a visible plume. You don't want that. Um, the solution, how do you, how do you uh, solve this problem? Well, the solution is to use some kind of magnesium treatment to remediate or treat the SO3 on the fuel side. Now, what about NOx emissions? NOx is terrible for air quality. You do they they do not want NOx. NOx is really really bad, and and unfortunately, it has an aspect of it that makes it very difficult to remediate, and that is that NOx formation is temperature dependent. See, NOx NOx meaning NO2 or NO3, is created from two things. It's created from nitrogen that comes from either the air or the fuel combined with oxygen, again, typically from the air. Um, the problem here is that the hotter the temperature you have, when we say NOx is temperature dependent, what we mean is if the temperature is hotter, let's say you're getting the best combustion possible, you are really burning that fuel to completeness. You're getting the most heat out of that as possible. On the one hand, that's good. However, hotter temperatures means you're going to get more of this, and that's bad. So what do you do? Do you sacrifice combustion just to reduce NOx? Uh, well, it depends how serious the problem is, but most plant operators are not going to want to have to face that 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 balance, that problem. So what can they do? Well, really, the only feasible solution to this is that they need to become more efficient and to increase their output relative to the amount of fuel they're burning. Because if then they will actually lower the amount of NOx, that is the effective amount of NOx that's produced relative to each unit of output. That's really the only uh, the only solution to this kind of problem. Lastly, okay, we talked about combustion efficiency. We talked about hot corrosion and cold corrosion. We talked about emissions issues. Last problem that we want to consider are sludging problems. You know, HFO users, if you're in the industry, you know if you leave that heavy fuel oil sitting in a storage tank, you're going to get sludge dropout. All and all residual heavy fuel oils have an inherent sludge content. They have heavy components. Uh, they're sitting over time, and that sludge will drop out and settle in the bottom of storage tanks and in delivery systems. And this is a problem because that sludge normally should be burned with the fuel. It's, it's part of the calorific value of the fuel that they've paid for. But if it's sitting in the storage tank, then they're not then they're not burning it. They're not getting what they paid for. How much does this cost users? Well, um, you know, we we we've had customers in India that lose 10 to 15 percent of their fuel value on sludge. A, uh, uh, a, a an amount that they can just eat. You know, so they have to have something to to try and solve this problem. And so what does this something look like? Well, it's going to be a fuel-borne solution, something that they're going to add to the fuel. Hopefully, it's going to, when it comes in 
contact with the sludge, it's going to draw that sludge back up into the fuel and essentially make it burnable again. So that is one of the solutions that, one of the feasible solutions that uh, heavy fuel oil users can consider to solve a petroleum sludge problem. And so what we have is we have multifunctional fuel treatments. You know, we talked about a bunch of different things and we've mentioned different uh, di different kinds of solutions. We've mentioned that uh, one way to solve corrosion problems is to use a magnesium additive. Uh, one way to solve low temperature uh, problematic uh, boiler deposit is, again, a magnesium treatment that will change their morphology. Um, one way to solve combustion problems is to use a fuel borne combustion catalyst. And of course, one way to solve sludging problems is to use a fuel borne sludge dispersant or sludge absorber. If you take all of those kinds of things and you uh, essentially combine them in one formulation, you can have a multifunctional fuel treatment for the HFO that effectively addresses all of those problems. What are each of these kinds of solutions? Well, first of all, magnesium. It was the first one that we mentioned. And magnesium additives are very well known within the industry. They've been used in the industry for years. And they, they're well known and they've been used a lot because they work. Uh, they can do a lot of really essential things. They change the boiler depositing. They, they eliminate high temperature corrosion. They react with the vanadium compounds in those those low melting point vanadate deposits to increase their eutectic melt, which changes their physical characteristics. Um, and they can improve efficiency and help maintain a clean boiler system. Again, magnesium additives have been used for years to do all of those things. Chambers, we said. Dow, uh, Dow Corning back in the 1950s established that organometallic combustion improvers in the fuel dramatically help increase and improve combustion. So if you use those, the operator is going to be able, essentially, going to be able to achieve the same combustion level either with less fuel or with less air supply. You can get the same product or better production output while minimizing the things that normally they have to contend with as far as trading off with problems. Um, and this can help go a long way towards combating cold and corrosion because they can achieve the same combustion level, the same output, but they can do it with less air supply. And that means they're going to have fewer cold and corrosion problems without having to sacrifice combustion efficiency. And so all of these things can be found in the ATX line of multifunctional solutions. Bell Performance has been making ATX since, um, I want to say 1952 is when we made our first ATX formulation. It was the early 1970s when that was reformulated to the form that is found today. Uh, today's ATX uh, products, uh, formulations for fuel that contain combustion catalysts, including organometallic iron, among others. They contain oil-soluble magnesium deposit modifiers, fuel oil stabilizers, and those very important asphaltine dispersants. So let's look at some of these a little bit more closely. Okay, ATX 1400 and 1100T. The T stands for turbine grade. What that means is that both these formulations contain a very high-quality magnesium sulfonate. Um, this magnesium sulfonate is suitable for uh, applications. So ATX 1400 and 1100 are essentially single functions. They are really the most unique products in the ATX line. Most of the other ATX formulations are multifunction ones. They have combustion improvers, the combustion catalyst, they have the sludge dispersants, but there are some customers that just want high quality magnesium sulfonate to solve the corrosion problems, to neutralize vanadium, and to solve the boiler deposit problems. And that is what ATX 1400 and ATX 1100T really deliver for you. The multifunctional products, they solve a whole host of different 
uh, HFO problems. You know, they solve deposit problems. They help reduce flow, which typically happens when you get an excess buildup of certain kind of deposits in the wrong area. They help with heat transfer, helping to restore optimal heat transfer because they're helping to remove those insulating deposits. They help with high temperature corrosion. They help with low temperature corrosion. They help with opacity. Uh, they help make maintenance easier. And of course, uh, pre-combustion, they help to disperse sludge and water in the stored fuel. Um, the multifunctional ATX products typically are identified by these numbers. We've got 950, we've got 1004, we've got 1018, and 1020. Um, all of these formulas contain uh, these basic kinds of things. They contain the oil-soluble magnesium. They contain uh, the, the multiple organometallic combustion catalysts, uh, typically three or four of them combined. and they sludge dispersing surfactant. So um, the difference between 950 or 1004 or 1018, 1020 is that the amount of this specific ones can be skewed to customer needs. So in essence, formulations, they are each one of them designed to be one formulation that addresses all the major problems that the heavy fuel oil user really has. So um, Let's go back to the single functionals. We mentioned 1400T and 1100T. Uh, we said that the difference with them is that they were single function uh, delivery, I want to say delivery. They deliver the high quality turbine grade magnesium, oil soluble base, high, uh, 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 high, high enough quality, excuse me, for use with gas turbines, which is why they are turbine grade. That's why they're designated with the T in their formulation name. Um, the 1100T, as you might be able to guess, contains 11 per. Uh, it's really equivalent to Chemtra's high base uh, M11 product. Um, the 1400T contains 14% 14 magnesium, and so it's relative to calculate exactly how much what your treat rate should be if you have your fuel spec. Uh, benefits you're going to get, well, like we said, you're going to fix high temperature corrosion. You're going to fix those uh, semi-liquid or molten deposit formations. You're going to neutralize SO3, which helps with low temperature corrosion. You're going to reduce emissions of sulfuric acid, and you're going to reduce stack opacity. Again, difference between single function and the multifunction. 1400T and 1100T do not contain the surfactant package, and they do not contain the organometallic combustion catalyst. Now, we have mentioned magnesium multiple times. It's time to look a little bit more closely at how magnesium in ATX solves slagging problems. Um, first thing, um, of we've already shown that it's been demonstrated in the field that magnesium helps to fix slagging problems. If you inject or add a magnesium-based additive into the, the HFO, when that, when that fuel oil is burned, uh, that magnesium will actually act upon the deposits and will incre it will combine with them. And the resulting combination deposit actually has a much higher melting point than it did before. With the higher melting point comes a significant change in its physical characteristics. They're more brittle. Uh, sometimes in the industry, they will, they will use the term friable. All that means basically is that they are, they're almost dry and they will actually break off from the surface and fall off over time. Now, another thing that magnesium does is magnesium acts, the oil soluble magnesium actually attacks and penetrates existing low temperature deposits and actually helps remove those is a very significant benefit that you can't get with a conventional, let's say, magnesium oxide, which is not oil soluble. Now, um, this customer here, before their trial, these were some of their heat transfer tubes. And uh, as you can see, they had significant deposit buildup on those. Three months into the trial of treating their fuel oil, you can see that those deposits are they're falling off those. There's, these tubes are significantly cleaner than these tubes. Six months in 
trial, you can see that those those tubes are clean. They they might get a little bit cleaner, but they're they're very close to being back to what they should be. So, uh, two things that you should be able to take away from this: first of all, that magnesium, the oil soluble magnesium in the ATX products, actually penetrated existing deposits and helped clean them off. Second thing was that it does not. <laughs> It took them between three and six months. But these kinds of deposits don't build up overnight, and they don't get removed overnight, but they will get removed. And uh, the you may be able to see the key nuance of this, which is that they did not have to shut down to get this. This happened strictly through treatment of the fuel oil with ATX. It happened over the course of just normal operation. They kept doing the same things they were doing before, and it solved their deposit problems. But deposit, so, uh, deposit control is something that oil-soluble magnesium is very effective at, but it's not the only thing that it does. It also helps solve corrosion problems, neutralizes excessive sulfur, sulfur trioxide, and cuts down on the, the, you know, the subsequent sulfuric acid formation. How does it do it? Well, a couple of different pathways. First thing it does is it helps remediate or fix those catalytic deposits. So if those catalytic deposits, those vanadate deposits from the previous slide, if these aren't hanging around anymore, then they're not going to be able to be in proximity when that SO3 gas comes and passes by them. And so it's going to be, it's going to reduce the, 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 the catalytic effect of those deposits. They'll also neutralize acid formation. And of course, as we've seen, they increase the melting point of the hot slag deposits, which means the reduction of those surfaces is significantly addressed as well. Um, what else? What else do ATX MFAs or multifunctional additives do? Well, they give the operator a significant leg up in trying to we say solve the dilemma of the excess air bounds. Uh, when they use ATX MFAs, the 950 or the 1004 or the 1020, the ones that have the organometallic combustion catalyst, then what, what they're going to get is they're going to get cat provers that uh, promote more and greater combustion reactions at the same point than they would have gotten if they hadn't used it, basically. Um, and this allows the operator to get the same level of combustion, but they can use less excess air if they want, which means they have better control over balancing efficiency versus preventing corrosion problems, lowering SOX uh, formation, among other things as well. It's pretty clear that magnesium is, is pretty essential to solving HFO problems, but no discussion about uh, uh, magnesium would be complete without acknowledging that there are different choices of the kind of you want to use. Uh, there are basically two predominant uh, uh, forms. There's a slur magnesium oxide slurry and there's oil soluble magnesium. And it is important to know the differences between them if you want to make the best choice for what you need. So it's important to be familiar with the pros and the cons of the dominant. First, take slurries. Slurries have been around for a while. They were they were actually the predominant form that was used for a long time, and for a good reason. A magnesium oxide slurry is just basically a suspension of MgO magnesium oxide particles in some kind of carrier. Now. They're not soluble in petroleum, which is why they have to exist in a suspension. And uh, to their credit, that's extremely inexpensive to make. So uh, that was probably one of the reasons why what, what they call mag ox slurry became so, so well known in the industry, because it was cheap and it was easy to get. Um, so what the magnesium oxide slurry does, it's small particles. Um, because it's just little particles of MGO, they're only active on the surface. And basically, it works by encapsulating uh, the contaminants in a layer of magnesium oxide buildup. Now, what can this do and what, what, 
what can it do and what can't it do? Well, in order to treat the problem, they have to build the deposit up. Um, the deposit then shields the the well the new deposit shields the old deposit here from contact and exposure with SO2 and SO3 gases. So it interrupts it physically interrupts the contact between what would have been catalytic deposits and the sulfur gases that are seeking to be catalytically affected by it. However, um, because of the nature of how it works, you can run into a problem where if the deposit is too great, you can actually be overly, uh, overly isolate or insulate it. And if that happens, you actually will hamper the heat transfer that you that that you're getting, and that is not something that you want to do. Now contrast that mechanism with how oil soluble magnesium in ATX works. Um, the oil soluble actually it does not form a layer on top of the deposit. It actually will penetrate the deposit. It will go into deposit and then it will start to react and it will start to change its morphology and change its physical characteristics from the inside out. And so what happens is that over time, the oil soluble magnesium actually helps to penetrate and remove the existing deposits because of the way it changes their physical characteristics. So they drop off the old deposit's been removed, and all you have is a thin layer of magnesium that remains. You now have the optimal solution for getting the best results with your system. Now, um, if you clean things up like that, well, then you're going to have a more efficient boiler. You're going to have cleaner heat transfer surfaces, which means the heat transfer is going to be where it needs to be. And, of course, you're not going to have and of conversion of SO2 into SO3 because those deposits are not around to catalytically influence them by their physical presence. Now, so uh, oil-soluble magnesium is more effective at combating existing deposits. Uh, another big issue is that magnesium slurries cause wear and tear in uh, delivery systems. In fact, it's one of the biggest downsides to using a slurry is that it does wears out it. It's abrasive and it wears out the nozzles on things like the burner tip. So here you have a new nozzle. This is an oil gun and it's got a nozzle and it's got it, these spherical holes. This is the way it's supposed to look like. But when you start adding insoluble magnesium oxide and running it through this, that those those abrasive little particles actually change the shape of the the nozzle holes over time. This is not going to deliver the fuel into the combustion area with the same efficiency and the way it's supposed to as compared to this. And that is a problem that users have to contend with if you're using a magnesium oxide, uh, a magox slurry. Um, the, the basic downside they're going to have is that if their fuel's not, it means it's not going to burn properly. They're going to get higher levels of unburned carbon and higher levels of of coke particles that are formed. Another challenge with magnesium oxide slurries: they typically have to have their own dosage tank, and the dosage tank has to have a stirring mechanism in it because magnesium oxide slurries will settle over. If you've ever been cooking. If you mix up a flour water slurry, same kind of thing. You leave that for a period of time, all the flour is going to drop down to the bottom. You have to circulate it and mix it up to ensure that the particles are uh, homogeneously distributed. Now, apart from the inconvenience to have a, a slurry dosage tank with a, uh, a stirring unit in it, the other issue is that if if you don't know that it is homogenous at all times, then how do you know that you're getting the same, the, the optimal amount of uh, magnesium oxide delivered into the fuel oil? Uh, the, the shorter answer is you have a way to know that for sure. You just really have to just rely on your best guess. And that, unfortunately, is a drawback with magnesium oxide slurries. Contrast that with 
the oil soluble magnesium in ATX. Since it is oil soluble, that means it's dissolved in the petroleum. When you add that to the fuel oil, it disperses and dissolves evenly. And that means that uh, you're not going to have any settling issues. And you're going to, you, you can be pretty sure that you're going to have the right, you know, homogenous and even distribution of oil. And that, that's an important consideration to, to have. So um, in the end, uh, with these, these, these marked differences between magnesium oxide slurries, how they work, and soluble magnesium and how it works, the proof is in the pudding. And here, the proof is customer in Long Island that for years used magnesium oxide, magox. Uh, they had their own dedicated holding tank. They pumped it into their fuel oil. And this is what their tubes looked like, not very clean. They were switched over to the ATX formulation. Uh, typically, 1020 is what they used. Um, and it had the oil-soluble magnesium, and this is what those tubes looked like after a period of time. Would you rather have this, or would you rather have this? I know which one I would rather have. Same customer, uh, different area of the plant. Uh, deposits with magnesium oxide here, mm, not looking very good. Deposits after use of oil-soluble magnesium looking very nice. Um, last thing I think we need to consider, uh, opacity. We touched on it a little bit earlier. We mentioned a couple of key things with it. Um, opacity, to, to reiterate, opacity is just means a visible plume. It means that the general public can see stuff coming out of that stack. Um, it's typically caused when you have a couple of different things. You've got the presence of sulfur trioxide coming out of here. And you've also got water vapor. So when sulfur trioxide and water vapor are present together, they're going to condense, of course, and they're going to form sulfuric acid. Now, if you have uh, any particles of you know, partially burned or unburned carbon in there, well, then uh, you can have an undesirable interaction between the sulfuric acid and those, and that's going to lead to your opacity problem. Um, opacity typically becomes a danger when SO3 levels in the exhaust gases are uh, parts per million. Um, and typically, a dirty unit is more likely to have SO3 levels greater than 5 ppm. It's more likely to have any of these kinds of problems. So dirty units tend to uh, have a greater chance of having opacity problems than clean units do, which is probably why people object to them, because they, they intuitively recognize <clears throat> that if they can see stuff coming out of that stack, that there's something going on in there that's probably not good. So... Um, opacity, technically speaking, is the percentage of light transition through an emissions plume. High opacity light gets through. It's harder to see through it. Major sources of opacity are a com the presence of particulate presence, sulfuric acid presence, and then both of those combined. Now, when we say both of those combined, what do we mean? Well, um, <clears throat> typically, uh, in order to measure opacity, They'll take a, a opacity reader and they will put it in a place like the bottom of the stack. And they will actually measure the difference in light transmission from this side of the stack. And then uh, a, 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 a separate reading unit on the other side will essentially pick up how much of that transmitted light reaches it. Now, um, opacity, it very much depends on particle size. Um, you know, when you have a, a, a an emission stream that has a certain a number of uh, particles, they're going to be all different sizes. They're going you're going to have a distribution of different sizes. Um, the ones that are usually two tenths to eight tenths of a of, of of a micron, those have the highest influence on opacity. Um, so. One thing that that tells us is that if you can do something during combustion to reduce those the size of those particles, you can reduce the visual opacity by basically producing less of those particles or producing a lot more smaller ones. Now, uh, we say that 
the presence of particulate is 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 influencing, but also sulfuric acid aerosols are very much influenced. So you have SO3 presence, you have water vapor presence. They combine and of course form sulfuric acid. Now, what that acid does is that acid then combines with the small droplets. Uh, they they form small um, and then those droplets actually condense onto the the, uh, the the carbon particles, and it increases them in size, but just enough that you can now see a visible, uh, you know, opacity or opaque plume. Here you can see the acid condenses onto the smaller particulates. It increases their size, uh, and you can see them better. Now. Uh, what does ATX do? Um, well, as we said, the multifunction ATX formulas do a number of things that all have a balancing act, and one of the elements of the balancing act is that they can help with opacity problems. Because opacity is a phenomenon that plant operators want to avoid as much as possible. So um, <clears throat> if opacity uh, is caused by the presence of number one acid droplets and number two particulates, then the way that you solve opacity problems is that you cut down on the production of acid and you cut down the, cut down on the number of carbon particulates. And ATX has the highly effective package of components that reduce the particle load and also allow the plant operator to better control um, um, the production of SO3. So both of those things are elements that ATX acts upon and really gives the plant operator some great options for making sure that they can have the highest uh, uh, efficiency as possible while also cutting down on concurrent problems like uh, plumes and opacity issues. Lastly, mentioned earlier about sludge dispersant. And we said that one of the things that, that you can do on the fuel side is you can add a dispersant to the HFO. And that dispersant will come in contact with any sludge, all that up into, back up into the fuel, essentially recapturing uh, that lost heating value. Well, uh, the, the, the formulation that does this is the Bell Tank Treatment SDF. Uh, SEF was a, a formulation that we introduced a couple of years ago, really to give heavy fuel oil a uh, more powerful option to try and solve these petroleum sludge dropout issues. Um, it was introduced in 2015, and it differs from ATX fundamentally in that SDF is a single function problem solver. What does it do? Well, it uh, when you when uh, it comes in contact with the, uh, then it disperses it and helps recover it, draws it back up into the fuel, where it then travels back out into the combustion area and is burned as it's. Um, SDF has an an, an amide surfactant formula, and it works in all ranges. Fuel crude oil or heavy fuel oil or number one, or number four diesel, even naphtha. And it also provides corrosion protection. In fuel oil that's treated with SDF, it actually lays down a, a, a protected layer on all the metal surfaces that it contacts, which helps against corrosion. Since its introduction in 2015, it's been fairly successful. Uh, introduced into both the municipal sector and uh, with private sector fuel storage uh, customers in the state of Florida. So when properly mixed into the fuel, because again, it has to be mixed into the fuel and has to be, have residency time in order to contact the sludge and draw it into the fuel, these are the kind of results that you can have. Uh, this was from a municipal fuel storage tank. Left, as you can see, had significant sludge uh, presence that was drawn up during the, the sampling process. This fuel was treated with SDF. All of this sludge is now disappeared in here. That's a pretty dramatic result. And their storage tank after treatment with that Bell tank treatment SDF is now uh, about as clean as it is. So 
we have covered a lot of information showing how and why various fuel-borne treatments for heavy fuel oil, how and why they work, problems that they solve, and uh, how some HFO additives are preferable to others, are more effective than others. So let's try to, to, to let's start to talk by looking at some of the specific value points that a person, a user who's aiming to solve problems, some of the specific value points that they might be aiming to achieve. We might even want to consider some specific customers as we're talking about this. All right, so first let's consider a customer that they use more than 2,000 metric tons daily consumption of HFO and or naphtha fuel. So, um, you know, they're not a huge customer. They're probably an industrial one. Um, their fuel was treated with ATX, typically in treat rate between 1 to 3, 1 to 6,000. Uh, the optimal treat rate for them was determined through optimization testing. You can start with the baseline, but one of the things you have to do with fuel oil treatment is you have to pay attention to your operating parameters, dial the, the treat rate you know, up and down until you get the best results that you're going to get. So given their fuel oil consumption, they're going to use between 360 and 720 liters of ATX per day. Now, uh, what's the value that they're going to get? Well, um, the value partly comes from the cost of the fuel. Cost of fuel definitely influences return on investment. Um, so let's say that fuel oil is $500 per metric ton. Um, it has been dropping in over the last few years. And so probably going to go up, but for now let's consider $500 per metric ton. What would be the fuel savings, or what would, excuse me, what would be the monetary savings that would be realized for this customer if they have an improvement in their fuel usage? Well, the first thing when we're talking about this is we say, look, we always project conservative uh, fuel usage improvements because, well, they're cheap, but second of all, uh, you want to you, you you we want to be able to show that you don't have a huge percentage improvement in order to realize substantial value, and that's exactly uh, what was true with this customer. Um, all they needed was a one to three percent improvement in order to get a pretty substantial ROI. In fact, um, just by looking at fuel savings. Uh, a customer that uses 10 metric tons, or excuse me, that, that uses 1,000 metric tons per day of fuel, if they get a 1% improvement, uh, they're going to save 10 metric tons of fuel per day, which is going to equate to approximately, depending on fuel, $1,000 a day of savings just on the 1% improvement. Again, cost and savings figures can vary, but the principle is the same. You do not need a huge percentage improvement in order to get a substantial return on investment. And beyond fuel consumption, so you have to ask these other questions when you're, when you're assessing the total value of doing something like this. Uh, you know, what's the value of extending shutdown intervals? Uh, let's say that you can extend intervals by a month. How much value are you going to be reclaimed? If you know how much uh, income and how much money is lost during, you know, for X number of hours during shutdown, you quickly realize that that could be this. This could be the biggest savings associated with ATX use. For, indeed, for many, the greatest aspect of their ROI is recognized in this area, not by looking at whether they saved 1% or 1.2% on their fuel usage. Now, who's been using these solutions? We said the AT formulated in the early 1950s, but in its current form, it was for formulated in the early 1970s. And <clears throat> we have uh, a, a fairly diverse customer base, both in power generation and also in light, medium, and heavy industrial, both in the United States and abroad. Uh, first customer, Northport Power Station. Northport Power Station is an excellent example of a fairly large 
has found great value in using ATX as a prevented problem solving measure. It's the largest oil fired power generation station on the United States East Coast. It's in Long Island. In fact, it provides uh, anywhere between 25 to 40 percent of all the power needs for Long Island. They have been using ATX since 2001, and since this is being recorded in 2016, that's 15 years. Primarily, they've used it uh, for deposit control in their boilers. They do not even keep track of fuel consumption improvement because their number one thing is keep these clean, keep the deposit problems down. Uh, Tarbert Generation statement Station in Ireland uh, when they used ATX, they found their boiler availability was improved, couldn't have to shut down as much. They had better heat transfer and efficiency. Uh, their soot blowing and their boiler tube corrosion problems went away. Their soot, soot blowing problems was improved, improved and the boiler tube corrosion problems went away. They ended up saving close to $950,000 per year just by using the one of the ATX multifunctions. Other industrial customers, both domestic and international customers, like Southern Soft Drink in Ireland, saving between you know, in fuel savings. MC Terminal in Japan, which is a Mitsubishi terminal located in Hiroshima, they use it to reduce their acid smut emissions, and they were able to reduce those between. 19 and 50 percent, which gave them a significant public relations coup because the resulting community before the ATX use were not with. That's why they decided to start using it. Taiwan, lots of industrial customers in the country of Taiwan, uh, typically in whether it's hotels, uh, hospitals, textiles, uh, 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 plastic dyeing, that's color ring dyeing. Um, they all report fuel savings between 5 and 9%, along with concurrent reductions in those problematic emissions, emissions and NOx emissions between 10 and 50%, not gross, but relative to unit of output. That is a significant drop for these folks. And then tank treatment SDF, since it's our newest formulation, it is making inroads primarily among the municipal fuel storage uh, sector in the state of Florida. People who use it, city of Orlando, city of Tampa, numerous small and medium cities and counties who all store fuel, and certain private sector businesses in uh, the state of Florida. CenturyLink, Bright House, uh, Circle K, largest company owned convenience store chain in the United States, using tank treatment SDF to keep their fuel storage tanks clean and problem free from sludge. So Bell Performance, you know, who are we? You know, uh, we formulated the world's first fuel additive in 1909. Uh, this, it was a detergent package that our namesake Robert Bell made for uh, gasoline at the time. Um, he formulated his first heavy fuel oil treatment in 1952. So we have been treating fuel for probably longer than anyone. We have national direct sales and distribution presence in the United States, and we work through a lot of dealers and distributors in Canada, Latin America. Uh, we have exposure in probably 16, 17 different countries, both in the EU and non-EU uh, countries like Japan and China and Australia, India, those kind of places. So um, <clears throat> we hope that you have been that that we've been able to effectively convey everything that we wanted to cover, uh, and we have covered a lot of things. Um, we've covered a lot of real estate problem buildings for the people who have to use it. Rose that build up, sludge, uh, uh, sludge dropout storage, those kinds of things. We talked about what those problems look like. They lost uh, the users of heavy fuel oil. And we've spent time explaining practice recommendations for the best solutions to solve those problems. And we talked about how and why those recommendations uh, and those solutions have proven to be beneficial 
for fuel oil users. And then hopefully, uh, woven throughout this entire discussion, is hopefully we have been able to build a case to you that shows that the ATX line of multifunctional fuel oil performance manufacturers really have a lot of value to offer for fuel oil users, and that if you're one of those, um, then ATX is probably going to give you what you need. Hopefully, we will have been able to um, build a good case for why maybe we should talk a little bit further about what you need and whether we can help you. We can't help everybody, but we would welcome a, a the opportunity to at least talk about what your goals and what your goals are, what your challenges that you're facing, and maybe we can help you uh, goals and solve those challenges. So, um, the the bottom line for us is that we believe that for uh, for problem solving fuel treatments with magnesium and other uh, you know effective ingredients, uh, we is the right choice. And uh, so that brings us to the end of our discussion today. Now, again, we've gone over a lot of stuff and. Um, you may have some questions. And so what I've done is I have my email at the bottom of this uh, slide. It's ebjornstad at bellperformance.net. If you have any questions or comments, then please send me an email. Uh, let me know that you were looking at uh, the fuel oil treatment solutions for combustion and storage uh, uh, presentation. And uh, that you might have some questions. I will be very happy to do my best to get you the answers that you need. So thanks very much for taking the time to discuss this today. Uh, I am Eric Bjornstad with Bell Performance. We will see you next time. Bye.